Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Veg Grow Up podcast. My name is Richard and I want to inspire and encourage you to grow your own food. And I do this by turning my garden and my allotment into lean, mean food producer machines, churning out all the vegetables, fruits and herbs that we ever need. Now coming up this week, I'm going to talk to you about the hazel sticks that I use on my allotment. We have a great recipe from Chef Scott. I also talk to you about my daily routine on the allotment. But before that, I've got a couple of bags of compost that I've been sent that I want to talk to you about. Let's go outside and I'll talk to you about those. One of the things that us gardeners always need is good compost. Now, I'm not talking about the compost that we make in our compost bins. That stuff is full of nutrition, don't get me wrong, but it's not really a potting mix that we can use in pots or to really grow plants in. It helps feed the soil, but it's not really what we class as compost. What I'm talking about here is the bags of compost that we buy from a garden centre. I believe that we should be rephrasing all these composts into their different terminologies. So when I say bags of compost, what I'm really talking about is potting compost or a potting mix. Since peat-free composts have become more and more available, I have noticed that there has been a real struggle to get decent quality compost. Now I'm all for going peat-free. I went peat-free a few years ago. But since the ban is now looming, all these compost companies have been stepping up their peat-free compost. And it hasn't been great in many ways. I've had a lot of feedback from many listeners who have found things like chopped up credit cards, large rocks, stones, bricks and even uncomposted twigs inside their bags of compost. And it's left a lot of them feeling a little bit unsure of what to do now what i would say i have actually spoken to many of these companies when i've been made aware of it and i've challenged them on it and these companies are genuinely concerned that people are finding this in their composts what i would say if that does happen to you if you do find it to be under good quality let your garden center let the company know they will often look after you and try and sort things out it's in their interest of course but these things do happen and they do go through the mix the real problem with it is the green waste that is being used if you think everything that goes into your green waste bin if you're not composting ends up going through the machines to become compost and sometimes that ends up in these mixes and this is coming from some very reputable well-established well-known brands that sell compost One of the composts that I've recommended over the last year is sold by a shop called The Range and it's from a company called Supergrow and it's labelled as organic compost. But what it does say is it's perfect to dig into existing beds and borders. It's 100% organic and peat free. Now last year I used this quite a bit in our pots and it did do quite well. It did have a bit of a smell to it, I will admit that, but it did do quite well. In fact we grew potatoes in part of a trial with different compost mixes to see what compost did the best in. And based on the price they didn't do too bad. But... What I've noticed in recent months is that the compost does seem to not be as good quality. We're getting really large clumps and balls of compost that don't break down easy, which is making it difficult when we're using it to pot up some of our young plants. I would say reading the packet, it's not really designed to be used as a potting mix it is more probably for what you would mulch your beds with and it does say that on the label but at four bags for 10 pound it's hard to say no and as i said i had a lot of success using it in potting mixes last year but i in all honesty now i don't think it is worthwhile One of the struggles I've always had is I've always tried to remember that not everybody can afford to buy the best. As much as I think the best is worthwhile, I I believe in spending money where it needs to be, we are all got certain budgets that we have to stick to. And running down to a garden centre and spending £15 on a bag of compost is not really appealable to everybody when you can go and buy four bags for a tenner at another place you know it's something to always bear in mind that being said what has happened this year i've been sent some compost from a couple of companies to trial out and 
so far, I haven't really started trialing them out, but I've opened up the bags to have a look and see what we've got. And so far, I'm quite impressed. Now, these two bags, they're 50 litre bags, but looking at them, they're actually bigger than the bags that I got from the range, from the Super Grow. So this has made me wonder if the Super Grow is as good a deal as I think. I'm not sure. But the first bag that I have is from a company called Heart of Eden. Now, we're actually going to be getting these on the show in not too distant future to talk about this pro their, their products and talk about peat free. Now, I've opened up this bag and I'm going to grab a handful and just see what we've got. So, unfortunately, when we're in garden centres, it's not so easy to open up a bag of compost to really see what we've got. It's one of those annoying things. I've often thought the compost should be sold by the bucket and we go and take a bucket every time we want compost. And that way we can actually see what a compost is like. But what I can see, you know, this compost, it's really well rotted down stuff. It looks absolutely fantastic. It smells really earthy, which is what you want from compost. It looks a nice dark brown colour. The super growers are not a real black colour and it stinks. And what I've also noticed with a super grow when I stick my hand into it, it's very difficult to clean my hands afterwards. This stuff, if I brush my hands off, brushes off pretty easy. So I'm quite impressed with that stuff, I have to say. Now, Heart of Eden is for sale in many garden centres or online. Buying online is something that, when you factor in postage and packaging, doesn't really make it cost effective. But, what I thought, if I've spent £120 spread out across a year buying this Super Grow compost, surely then I could spend a little bit more maybe and get a pallet load of compost once a year instead of spreading it out. That might be something we do in the future. Of course, then we have to think about storage, but not too much of a problem. Now, the second bag I have is Rocket Grow. Now, this is a company that's been on my radar for a while. Now, they are available in some garden centres. Again, these are pretty expensive bags, but, you know, if it's worth it, it'll be worth it. Now, again, I'm looking at this. It's a really nice dark brown. This is a green waste compost so they've used green waste and they've added some of their own mix which is a mix of uh, straw barley maize and things like that oh, it smells really nice and earthy again as well and this looks absolutely amazing both of these bags look like they are going to be fantastic so the question is how do we trial these things out what can we do to see if they're going to work out for the best this does take time. This is one of the problems when it comes to gardening and we trial things is that we need our plants to grow and just to see how well they do. So what we're going to do, we're going to grow some tomatoes in a pot and see which compost grows the best tomatoes. So we're going to have a pot of Heart of Eden, a pot of Rocket Grow, a pot of Super Grow and a pot of our homemade compost as well. And we're going to plant the same variety of tomatoes in each one. We're also going to do the same with hanging baskets and we're going to get some trugs of lettuce as well to see what grows the best of lettuce too. Just to balance out the experiment a little bit more. Now, it's true that some veg will grow best in one type of compost and not the other. I'm not going to add any additives. I've seen in the past I would add things like biochar and things like that and mulch on the top as well. We're not going to do any of that. It's just going to be the compost and the plant and we're going to treat the plants exactly the same. Now, what I would like to know from you, of course, is what compost do you use and why? What compost have you had good results? And have you been having trouble with peat free compost please do feel free to let me know i'd love to hear what compost you use you can get in touch my email address is richard at vegetablepodcast.co.uk i'm going to head on down to the allotment in the meantime let's find out what's been going on in the supporters club this week well, I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. I just want to jump in quickly and just ask you to please rate and review this podcast. By rating and reviewing, you help us get found by more people who might be interested in growing their own food. It helps the algorithms work, if you like. And anybody who knows anything about content will know algorithms are a key thing. 
Now, a couple of comments that have came in over this last week. Uh, Lynn, once again, Lynn always leaves us some lovely feedback. And she says, Richard, you have ev- my every sympathy after losing so much to Whitefly, plus falling off the shelf. I lost a lot, including my tomatoes too. Amino lids in horse muck I used last year. It's heartbreaking. Lynn. Yes, that's a weed killer that is sometimes found in horse muck. But there was one comment that came in from Sarah that, first of all, hit me with panic, but then made me laugh. Her comment says, this is a joke. I didn't like the discount code for Premier Seeds. Did I need Dragon's Egg Cucumber Seeds? No. Did I buy them? Yes, along with 14 other packets that I didn't need. Love the podcast. (laughs) Thank you so much for that, Sarah. For those that might be interested in the Premier Seeds discount code, VEGPOD10, go save yourself some money when buying seeds. But there is another way you can also help support this podcast, and that is by becoming a member of our supporters club. To be a member, I charge just £5 a month, and for that you get extra behind-the-scenes podcasts and a collection of seeds sent to your door every month, and those seeds can be sown in that very month for details on that head to the vegpodcast.co.uk to find out more but it really does help keep the wheels running on this very podcast it really does help now down on the allotment this week i have managed to clear out the brambles from the gooseberries and the uncle tim's greenhouse and tidied those two areas up quite significantly but one question i get asked a lot is how do i manage to cope with an allotment i've always said i make daily visits to the allotment so what i thought i'd do today is just go through what i do every day that i visit the allotment my routine well i've just arrived down on the allotment for my evening trip now i try and visit the allotment every evening after work just on the way home only for about half an hour. The reason I do this, one of the biggest problems I find that people complain about with having allotments is that they don't feel they have their time. It is a lot of work looking after an allotment, just like it is looking after a vegetable garden at home. But anything worth doing does mean that you have to spend a bit of time on it. And that's what I genuinely believe. What I've learned over the years is there's a phrase that I think applies to gardening, little and often. And what this phrase for me means is that we make regular daily visits for, to the allotment for 20 minutes, half an hour every day, just doing our maintenance. Now, come the weekends, Saturdays or Sundays, we do spend a little bit more time on the allotment, a couple of hours. When I first took on our allotment, one of the things that we were told by the council is that an allotment takes up to four hours work a week. I would actually say at least double that in all honesty. There are things we can do to make it all the more manageable, but often that means spending a bit more money on things. And I feel an allotment isn't necessarily about spending money. It's about trying to do things out of necessity, shall we say. So... What the first thing I do, I always, first of all, go into this granddad's greenhouse. I'm going to do this right now. I come in here. I've always got my watering cans filled up with water in here. And what I do is I just water. At the moment, it's my onion seedlings that are in here. They're a little bit too young to go outside just yet, but I I think by watering them daily, it does get pretty warm in these greenhouses. In fact, I think we're going to have to move them over into the other greenhouses. I tidied that up over the weekend. But just by watering them daily, it just makes sure they get plenty of water. And once we actually start getting things growing in here, our cucumbers are going in this greenhouse, for example, it is going to need regular watering, at least every few days I would say the way I've set this greenhouse up does mean that it does sort of look after itself to a certain extent so now that we have finished inside the greenhouse what I will then do is just walk around this allotment and just make mental note of anything that is going to need doing at the weekend any big jobs or anything that if I don't tackle it immediately is going to die on a whole it's not too bad but just making all these mental notes and checks just saves quite a bit of loss in the future 
So one of the things that I can immediately see that really does need my attention is weeding of our asparagus bed. I'm not going to do that just today. It's not that serious, but that is something I'm going to be concentrating on over the coming weeks. Asparagus, of course, hating weeds and it's going to start growing. So we've done our walk around. We've got nothing that really needs our immediate attention. So what I will then do now is start weeding. And I mentioned this earlier on this year. I always start in bed one, the first bed. That bed has been pretty well weeded. So it only takes a few seconds, but then I work myself along bed one, bed two, bed three, right up till I've gone through all the beds. Now, of course, if you've only got half an hour, you may not be able to go through all your beds. But it's all the case that if we start in the same place, we're just maintaining, we're spending less and less time in that same area, and we just gradually move forward throughout our weeding. Weeding is one of those jobs. Everybody hates weeding. It's a job that people will say they spend hours and hours weeding their allotment at a weekend and they often say they don't get much else done. So for me this is a good reason why I do it on a daily basis and I work through my system one right through all my beds. I still spend hours weeding every week but because it's spread out across the matter of seven days it doesn't feel so bad and within a couple of weeks if you've got a weedy weedy allotment you can pretty much see the difference it makes within a couple of weeks. It is incredibly incredibly easy to do. Now we might only have 20 minutes to do this in, at the end of the day. It is all about just using the time that we have to our advantage. But a few of the other things that I also like to do, on Fridays I like to feed my plants. It's what I call Feed It Friday. So at the moment I'm going around with some of my solid feeds and adding those to the beds that require it. When we get into the summer and we need some of that tomato feed, we of course will use that on a Friday as well. Often this means that it takes up the time that I would be spent weeding. Again, that's a Friday. It's not the end of the world. The rest of the week we've dealt with the weeding anyway. And come Saturday, Sunday, I can concentrate on some bigger jobs such as planting out. Thursdays I try and stream and cut the grass as well. I do have a bit more time on, on Thursday, so I might spend a little bit more time down here. And again, by doing it on a weekly basis, it actually does take less and less time. May is when the grass really starts growing, it can be a little bit tricky and you sometimes do need to cut the grass twice a week throughout May. But at the moment we can't even cut the grass because it is just so wet. Although, looking at it at the moment, I reckon a couple more days of decent weather we might be able to actually cut the grass. So that would be something to look forward to. And then at the moment, we haven't got to worry so much about watering. It's wet enough in the ground. But as we get more into the summer months, when it gets drier and drier, watering then becomes a bit more of a priority. Now, what I try and do, when we first plant out our plants, they do need a watering every day. The ground just isn't wet enough. The roots are trying to establish themselves. So just to encourage those roots, I try and water those plants every day. And that's where I always start. Then once the plants are established, I think it's better to just make sure that the roots go down deeper in order to search for good water sources. So after a week of watering daily, we might reduce it down to every couple of days and then every four days. I break my allotment down into four corners and I will again, beds one, two, three and four, I will water on day one and then five, six, seven, eight and nine, eight and nine being smaller beds, that will be on day two, 10, 11, 12, 13 will be on day three, 14, 15, 16, 17 on day four. And I repeat that quite regularly. Now, one of the things I have to say, when we do water on a four day basis, we have to make sure we water well. It does depend on the plant, of course. Some people will just flood and flood the, the ground and think that's okay. In some plants that can be okay. And I actually find that by doing that, the, the water seeps into the ground and it goes lower down, which is what you want. We want the roots of our plants to go lower down in search of water. 
but we also see add mulches and things like that. It's a very tricky thing to get right because some plants don't need as much water as others. It is all a case of just being mindful of what your plants needs. So that is what I try and do on a daily basis as part of my routine here on the allotment. Now there's something I need to take care of which is my hazel sticks. So I'm going to head on over to my hazel sticks. In the meantime, let's find out what Chef Scott has for us this week. Hi, it's Scott here. And this week I have the Premier Seeds Direct Seed of the Month recipe. And as you will know from last week's podcast, this month we have an unusual cucumber called Dragon's Egg. A really cool sounding and looking cucumber that's the shape and size of a goose egg. And I have to say I'm really enjoying the seed of the month segment and think the selection so far has been amazing. And I'm looking forward to growing and tasting dragon's egg cucumber for the first time. And I think this week's recipe will work well with them, as it will with other varieties of cucumber. For this recipe I have used standard cucumbers but I can't wait until I can do the recipe again with a dragon's egg. And this week's recipe is a Japanese style smashed cucumber salad. It's incredibly simple to make, but very tasty and goes perfectly with poached or roast salmon. So it's a very healthy meal that you will want to make time and time again. So let's head to the kitchen and hear how it's made. As usual, you can find this recipe and others on the veggrowpodcast.co.uk and on my Instagram page, Seed to Table Plot 13, along with a supporting video to go with it. For this recipe, you will need two cucumbers or 600 grams, one teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of light soy sauce, one tablespoon of rice wine vinegar. 2 cloves of garlic, finely chopped, 40 grams of ginger, finely chopped, 1 teaspoon of crushed dried chilli flakes, I use a Korean blend, and then 2 tablespoons of sesame seeds. Method. Start by smashing the cucumbers. Do this by bashing with a rolling pin until the cucumber splits and almost breaks apart. Smashing the cucumber creates more surface area and also creates nooks and crannies for the dressing to soak into. Once the cucumber has been smashed, roughly chop into bite-sized pieces, then sprinkle with salt and place in a colander and allow to sit for 15 to 20 minutes for the salt to draw out the cucumber water and drain away. After this, put the cucumber into a mixing bowl and mix with all the other ingredients and then serve and enjoy. And that's it from me this week. During the winter months, I coppiced my hazel tree. Now I have a hazel tree here in the allotment, just purely for the reason that I want hazel sticks. Now I use hazel sticks in place of bamboo canes. I used to use bamboo canes quite often. I think that is probably the one thing that most people will use. Bamboo canes, of course, being easy to buy from a garden center, but I personally think they're not the best thing. I always used bamboo sticks in the past. They were cheap, they were easy to get hold of. My granddad, in fact, he had bamboo growing in his garden. I think when he first brought his house over 80 years ago, one of the first things he did was plant a bed of bamboo. But over the 60, 70 years that he was living there, that bamboo did start to take over more and more areas. Even though it was in a concrete bed, it did spread. And it's not the best thing because it does have a tendency to spread. In fact, it actually spread into the neighbor's garden as well. It was a little bit tricky. But my granddad always encouraged me to come and harvest some of those bamboo sticks as much as possible as well, for that very reason, to try and reduce the amount of bamboo he had growing in his garden. I was always happy to do that. Obviously, his passing has made me rethink, and I do go into garden centres and I do see the bamboo canes that are being sold. I've brought a few in the past, but I don't think they really last that long anymore. They do seem to deteriorate, they're not as strong, they aren't as good as they used to be. And I don't know why this is. Bamboo, of course, it is possible to grow in the UK, but I don't know if it is farmed in the UK to be sold in garden centres. So, when I took on my original allotment, one of the things that I wanted was a hazel tree. One, to try and get hazelnuts, but two, 
for these hazel sticks. Now I already have some hazel sticks that I've cut down in years past and they are what we will be using mostly this year. They are seasoned, they are strong, I think they look so much better than bamboo canes as well and they are thicker. But the ones that we've cut down this winter, what I'm having to do is just go through all of them, remove some of the tiny little branches off the side so that they are going to be nice and straight. This may involve trimming down some of the sticks as well, just to make them a bit more usable. What we really want is nice, long, straight sticks. I've put them to one side throughout the winter because what we don't want, if we went and stuck these in the ground, there's a good chance they might root and start growing, which isn't really what we want. We want these to be able to use as canes, as growing beans up or peas up, that sort of thing. So we are being a little bit careful with just making sure that the sticks are completely dead. What I have seen on some of the small little branches, even though that these sticks have been cut off for months, they've been stacked up off the ground, they are starting to show signs of buds starting to grow so something is going on inside they are still alive and we again i would be worried about sticking these in the ground we'll give it another couple of months and just see what happens by about mid-may june is when we're going to want to start using these anyway as i said earlier we have the sticks that we've used in the past they are already seasoned they are dead but they can go straight in the ground ready for our beans to grow up I use these mostly for beans, of course. Tomatoes that we grow in a greenhouse, I have those growing up a piece of string. But outside, we probably use these hazel sticks as well for them to grow up. Beans have a tendency of just wrapping themselves around these sticks, so they grow nice and easy. But tomatoes, we do have to tie them in. What I've noticed with my tomatoes at home at the moment, they are 30 centimetres tall now. They are growing quite rapidly, but they are also at the point that they need a bit of support. Now, the traditional thing that gardeners would use is the green sticks that we can buy from garden centres. They're, they're small, thin sticks. They're actually quite strong. I'll give them their due there. But again, I find them to be quite expensive. What I like to use instead is little barbecue skewers. These are quite often bamboo or wood. They're about the same thickness as those green sticks, but they are so much cheaper when you get a lot more for your money. So if you are growing a lot of tomatoes or other things that need a bit of support, I highly recommend buying these barbecue sticks. These are the barbecue sticks that you would stick bits of meat and vegetables on to cook over your barbecue, made of possibly bamboo or wood, and that got a pointed top to skewer your meat. It is worth sometimes just snipping off the top or putting something over it so you don't cause any damage. But that's the same risk even with the green sticks as well. So what this means in recent years, I've moved more and more away from our bamboo canes. I still use bamboo canes because I'm not going to throw them away when they are still usable. But once they are beyond use, they will end up being in the compost heap and gone. And we will never buy any more bamboo canes. Sticking, of course, with our hazel sticks. Just one tree. And in a few years, you can end up with your own hazel sticks. Highly recommend it if that is something you are looking at. Right, time to head on home and I'll meet you back in the podding shed. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you will leave us a rating review on your podcast provider or consider becoming a member of your supporters club. But before I leave, I just got a little bit of a heads up. In a couple of days, I will be releasing a blog post for another competition where you can win a pair of tickets to Garner's World Live, which is in Birmingham. All the details will be on this blog post. So please do keep checking out. Keep an eye on social media for when that is released. But in order to win, all you've got to do is come up with a suggestion for what I can plant into a new Belfast sink that I've obtained this week. Yes, another Belfast sink, which brings us up to four Belfast sinks and two other sinks. We've got herbs growing in all the other sinks, and I want a few suggestions of what we can do with this other Belfast sink. It's completely up to you, and we'll do the same as what we did with the last competition. All entries go into a hat, and we choose the, the one out of it, and that's what we will do. 
Oh, well, no, no, I should just add, Hegwick has laid her first couple of eggs this week as well. So things are going great there. So if you do want to hear more about that competition when it gets released, keep an eye out on social media for all the details or on the blog post at theveggroundpodcast.co.uk. Of course, follow us and like us on social media as well at the same time. Right, with that, I'm going to wrap this one up. I will speak to you all again next time. So until then, please take care.